So, welcome everyone. Welcome to the Sotelo and Torbox talk today. I'm short of time, so uh, I, there won't be q and I'm the bad guy, so ask anytime you want. And I think, I hope I have a lot of things to say today. So let me introduce Cotello team. Uh, that is not Cotello team, there's the one Cotello member, the guy in the blue t-shirt, that's me. Uh, I work at Red Hat in the cloud division and I'm working on Cotello uh, project that is the cloud forms system engine product. Can you hear me well? Okay, uh, you can find me almost everywhere as LZAP. The first letter is not uh, capital I, it's L. Some folks just need to tune up their phones. And I've been pretty successful with, it, with this NIC for now 13, 15 years, but there's this Chinese guy. So if you, there was the camera, if, you, if you're watching this, stop it. And I can find me on with other these NICs too. Okay, post me anytime you want. And let's go ahead. So you will find me today talking about Catillo, the good news. I will be technical, so uh, just a sh very short introduction. The bad news is I don't have this t-shirt for you today. This is actually fake, some kind of e-shop, great e-shop that puts everything it finds on the internet on a t-shirt and you, know, you can buy it perhaps. I don't know, I didn't try it. Uh, although the talk box is in the you know, title of this talk, I want to attract to Daybot guys. I will be talking about JRuby and not much about Torquebox because you know, Torquebox is pretty easy to configure and once you have uh, your application running on top of you know, JRuby, you can, you can run it on Torquebox as well. So, and yeah, uh, I'll explain my motivation uh, to give you the context. Uh, I've been working on a small proof of concept to port Catello to JRuby. So I will, I will talk a little bit of, about the motivation we had and then about issues I had. And of course, a little bit of JRuby and Java, which one is better. And I'm happy to announce this talk will be cast free. No cat pictures at all today. So what is Catello? I've got a funny explanation, then I've got a real explanation. So let's, let's do the funny one. Catello is a open source contentment system management stack for data centers and cloud. Now you maybe, you have been expecting maybe a white, white picture of cloud, maybe some sky, something like that. But I decided not to lie to you today. I decided to show you what the, clouds, what the cloud looks like. So if you take a red pill, you wake up in your bed, the story ends, and you remember nothing. If you take a blue pill, I'll show you how does cloud look like. So this is cloud, data center, cloud. You're getting it? From our perspective, it's just a bunch of servers, right? Okay, enough fun. I think I've been asked today what a cloud is, and I'm not, not going to tell, talk about this today, but if you really want to know what a cloud is, and you're not fine with the Wikipedia definition, go ahead and uh, search for NIST cloud, definition of cloud computing. And if you find that, you'll find a Nice document, and it's really short. It has like 11 pages, and only on two pages you'll find the definition. And I won't go into details, but it's on-demand service, broad network access, resource pooling, rapid elasticity, of course, and you want to measure the thing. And there are some models and that kind of stuff. That's a cloud. Okay, enough fun. Let us be serious now. What can you do with Cotello? What is Cotello? First of all, I need to ask, how many of you are familiar with Red Hat subscriptions? Have, have, okay, half, maybe half. So, this is pretty easy. I like this feature. So, if you buy a product from Red Hat, you're, you're given a subscription, like for a magazine, right? And the artifact you get is something on the portal. If you go to the Red Hat customer portal, you can find it, uh, entitlement there, uh, so you can find a subscription there. For example, you buy five pieces of RHEL for one year, so what we call, you are buying five entitlements. Entitlement is a right to use the stuff. And on the portal, you can log in with your credentials. And then after you install your RHEL, you can use a tool called Subscription Manager, which is included in RHEL now. And you can register using your credentials. And then you can consume, using a subscribe command, you can consume this subscription. So you can actually decrease number one from the entitlements. 
Now, some people don't want to connect their production systems to the internet. Some people don't do want to have a better control uh, of subscriptions. They want to make some statistics or reporting. They want to see if they are in compliance. And maybe they want to manage content. So this is where Catalo helps you. Catalo is the man in the middle. And it can offer you subscription management and content management right now. And I'll be, you know, I'll be very quick. So, so if you deploy Catalo on, on your data center, you will be able to transfer your subscriptions from the portal to, to a Catalo instance. So what you, what you can do is you can log on to a custom portal, and then you can create the thing. Uh, the thing is called, uh, I think it, now it's, it has, has been renamed uh, to uh, application. So you create an application there. And you, you can transfer some subscriptions or all of your subscriptions to this application. And then you can export them to a file, which we call uh, a manifest, which is essentially a zip file, small zip file containing some, some certificates. Subscription uh, is based on the X509 certificates. And then you can import this file using a flash uh, you know, USB stick, or if you, if you don't have your uh, servers connected to the internet, to your Catella instance. There is a nice screen, and you can you know, select a button and then you can upload it. And magically, your subscriptions will appear in your Catello instance. And then you can, you know, you can re register the systems against Catello instead of against uh, your portal. And it works the same way. Catello is multi-tenant applications that can create uh, organizations, users per set permissions, and it works the same way. And of course, you can do some statistics and that kind of stuff. On the other, the second part of Catello is content management, and I won't go into details because I don't have time. Uh, basically, content means, for us, content means RPM packages, repositories, errata, everything you can find it in YAM repositories, and also Puppet content. Uh, current, current nightly builds of Catello uh, are based on the Pulp v version 2, which support Puppet, but it's not, uh, has been implemented yet in Catello code base, so you won't find any user interface for that but we will eventually support RPMs as well as puppets. And what you can do with this, you can, you can well, once you import your manifest, Catello will recognize all the repositories you have access to, because subscription manager, if you, if you do a subscription, it will drop a red hat repo file in this ATC slash yam.repos.d directory with all the repositories you, have, you, 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 have, you are subscribed to. And these are pointing to the CDN network, where you, where you can download them using an entitlement certificate because our CDN network is not wide open and you only can download or even see the content if you have a valid, valid subscription, valid certificate. So if you, if you import some, uh, thing, some content into Catello, uh, you can then download or sync the content into a Catello instance and then you can consume it. But there is some logic behind this. You can create, uh, you can manage the content efficiently. You can create uh, co containers, which, which we call environments, and you need to, you can, all the content is coming from the CDN, or you can uh, even create a custom repositories like Fedora or CentOS if you want. All the content is coming to a special environment called library, which you can think of it like a locker, which you can't register systems to. And if you want to register a system, you need to create environments. So you can create environments like testing, pre-production, production, and create a, a promotion path and then you can create another maybe environment like fast track production so you can have a second path of your content. And then you can register systems and you, you can use, use this. Uh, and there's a new concept of, uh, in the nightly builds, content views which are kind of sub-containers sub within environments so you can have production, in the production environment you can have a content view for, for your web servers maybe and another content view for your database servers and uh, this is uh, new stuff. So, and there is another open source project called Foreman, which brings you uh, provisioning and configuration management. But I won't uh, talk about this today. But the good news is you can use the content from Catello within Foreman easily. You can, you know, the content is just a bunch of YAM repositories, so you can define them in Foreman, and you can then do the provisioning part and integrate with Catello a little bit. But we are working towards uh, more integration of Foreman and Catello right now. Okay, this is how Catello looks like. This is a, a synchronized page. 
it's a web, uh, web, uh, web uh, application. It's written in ribbon ra rails, that's the point here. Uh, we have, and we have two subsystems, or we call them backend, en backend engines, Candlepin and Pulp. Candlepin is responsible for all the certificates and subscription management, and Pulp is responsible for all the you know, package management thing. And this is a nice feature, uh, package search, so you can actually you know, see what versions of packages are in which environments. And from Catello, we have uh, two products. Uh, that is a SAM, which uh, you get for free if you buy a RHEL subscription. And there is Cotelo System Engine, which is essentially, SAM is only the subscription part of Cotelo. And if you want more, you can buy a system engine, which is a Cotelo. Okay, enough. Fair enough. Um, 10 minutes. So what is Torbox and Ruby? As I said, I won't be talking about Torbox today, and I will focus more on JRuby. So JRuby is, uh, nice implementation on, uh, of Ruby uh, on top of JVM. It's a major stable product, I guess it's plus 10 years. And it does support 1.8 and 1.9 Ruby, which are incompatible uh, each other. And since it is running on JVM, it can leverage uh, all the good things like JIT. And the way it works, it, it is compiling the Ruby code into bytecode byte first, and then it's executing the bytecode on the JVM. And it does support ahead of time compilation, so you can take your sources and compile them into a classes. So if you don't want to distribute your source code, which is not the case for us, of course, you can do that pretty easily. You can work uh, via, you can uh, use JRuby from Java and vice versa. So it's a good fit for you know, projects that are coded in Java and you want to create another component maybe in a Ruby. And good news is it's in Fedora. Torbox, on, on the other hand, is a platform for Ruby on Rails, Sinatra, and Rack-based applications. And it is running on top of JBoss AS. So uh, it can offer things like messaging, scheduling, and caching, and all the good stuff from JBoss, JBoss AS to Ruby applications. Now, there is, there is a missing piece, and that th these missing pieces are APIs. Because for, in Ruby, we don't have, like, for example, JMS uh, API for messaging. But Torchbox guys are doing the best with communities to set up some decent uh, you know, st standards for that. And actually for Catello, we'll be able to leverage all of these. We have scheduling and we want caching and we, we want messaging. So it's a good fit. Torchbox is a very good fit for Catello. So now, why should we care to port to JVM? And actually, in my case, in my proof of concept, the you won't believe, but uh, the thing was memory. I, I ha we have issues with memory and with Catello. For some reason, I'm, for reasons I'm going to explain. And the second option is also good, it's, it's performance. But I'm, I will skip this for this talk today. I will, I, I will purely focus on memory issues and that kind of stuff. So, what was the issue here? So in Catello, we are using Thin. Uh, Thin is a uh, a web server written in Ruby with some native bits. And uh, the issue is here, if you are you know, working on a Ruby on Rails application and Catello is decent, a Ruby on Rails application expects some memory to be you know, eaten. And we can't just tell process, Ruby process is just market zero. It just needs this, pro this memory because of the design of Ruby. It, ha it needs to hold this AST tree and of course applications have some memory. And the issue here is uh, how to scale up. So before that, I'm going to cover a little bit more about threading and Ruby. <coughs> so state of threading in Ruby. When I say Ruby, I mean MRI Ruby, the standard C implementation. So in 1.8, which is an old version, uh, there are no threads. There, there are green threads, which are, you know, Ruby runtime based threads, which are not running uh, on top of, you know, they're not, not uh, using OS threads. And these are good for some things, but you can't really leverage the multiple cores, multiple CPUs. Fortunately, Ruby 1.9, which is the mo latest and greatest stable version, does support native threads. But there's a snag. This snag is called GIL. And actually, what it means, if one thread is executing a Ruby, this is important, Ruby underscore code, 
another thread can't execute a Ruby code, which could look like a big issue. As you can see on the, on the uh, left side, we have got a Ruby 1.8, old thing and does not scale well. On the right hand, we have J JRuby or Torbox, which scales pretty well. It does use you know, native threading of Java. And in the middle, there is Ruby 1.9, which, which has this GIL. But global interpreter lock is not an issue. If you, because Ruby, if there is a threat waiting for an I.O., Ruby can, you know, does not limit this by design. It can schedule another thread to be, you know, executing, executed. But there's a, another snag, and that snag is called native Ruby gems. Not all, not all native Ruby gems are capable of, you know, doing that. So in Catello, our practical, uh, practical results are uh, if uh, one thin instance are, is, ex you know, uh, executing a request, it's, it's not able to execute a second. It's just, it's, it's not scaling. So, threading, state of threading, not the best. Now, if you can't, you know, if you can't do threads efficient, it, it's, it is possible. I'm not saying this is not, it's not possible. There are other options, but if you can't do, do this efficiently, you, you, of, of course you can fork, because Linux OS is great in forking, right? It can do it fast, and it can, using a copy on write, it, it can leverage, you know, memory, the print process, and yeah, it, could, it works for, for HTTPD, this works for years, but there's another snag. Uh, Ruby, uh, global uh, garbage collector, is not COV friendly. So during the time, eventually if you, if you are sharing some, uh, some memory, during the time it will disappear and the, the two, two separate processes won't share any memory at all in the, in the worst case. There are options, like for Ruby 1.8, there is a Ruby Enterprise Edition, REE, which is now, uh, you know, this product, I think this project is dead, and due to licensing issues, I guess, it's not in Fedora. Fortunately, Ruby 1.9 has some RE optimizations in it, uh, like you can tune up a garbage collector not to execute so often, and there are a lot of optimizations, but still, it's not copy and write friendly. And I found recently that uh, Ruby 2.0, which is in beta right now, and it's heading to, you know, it's on the way to Fedora 19, I guess, is finally COV friendly, and yes, and using some bitmaps and tricks, and finally, you know, we will be able to share some memory between processes, and using some techniques, it will scale up uh, much better. So instead of forking, it's not the best. It's looking, you know, we have bright future ahead, but currently, right now, it's not the best. If you don't want to use, you know, Ruby 2.0, which is, you know, almost stable, I, I, I guess. There's this uh, blogger, Greg Weber, which uh, made a ni nice statement on his blog about that Ruby communities always insisted that preference is not an issue while constantly trying to find another way to deploy things. And there are uh, another things. Like most popular, we covered threading, we covered forking, and the most popular now Thank to J Node.js and Vertex and this kind of stuff, there's evented processing, which brings some parallelism, you know, to the web or, yeah, to the web and, but there's, there's an issue. So, to wrap this up, we have forking uh, options, the Fusion Passenger for some licensing issues, it has not been accepted to Fedora until now, and I think it's Fedora 18, the first version which supports Passenger. Passenger is Something like Mod Perl. Uh, it's a very decent uh, um, web stack for Ruby applications, and it does uh, reuse as much memory as possible using three levels of forkers, and it's pretty awesome. And with Ruby 2.0, I think this will be the way, the, the you know, the standard way to deploy Ruby applications. On the other side, we have Threaded. For example, Torquebox is a great example of fully threaded mode, you can you know, leverage threads in JVM and scale it, it's like it's in JBoss, so you can do this pretty well, it has been tested. And also, Torbox uh, offers you to fork uh, several JRuby instances within its container, so if you have some library that is not thread safe, you can do that. So it's a, Torbox is actually forking and threaded. And there's a thin, which is evented, a server, I will cover that uh, right now. And, but it has some issues. And Thin is actually 
you know, forking and event it, and it has some experimental support for threads. But these are the basic, you know, basic deployment options in Ruby. And usually, you are, you're not going, you know, the one way, you're usually uh, using several options uh, as one. So, as I said, we are using Thin for the deployment of Cotello. Uh, uh, so so the, the, to, to give you the context, uh, we have a mod proxy, Apache HTTP mod proxy, which distributes the two Thins. So you, you need to set up uh, this like multiple uh, load balancing for multiple uh, processes. And there's one snag. So if you have three requests here, uh, and Ruby on Rails is a model view controller you know, framework. So it does some routing, then you do some SQL stuff, then you do rendering of resp and uh, render response. Yeah, uh, yeah. Then the, then you do some rendering, and then you are handing this over back to the to the uh, web stack, and it's handing a response back. Now the the boxes or the the words with the star are I/O intensive, while control and render are CPU intensive. And what this thing can you, can do because thing is even the you know server, it can it can wrap these three requests into three big you know circles and and process them. And this does not scale well. Actually, if due to issues I described, there are you know I/O blocking, there's GIL, and it does not scale well. So to unleash full power of event processing, you need to rewrite your application. You need to change you know, your application a lot. And due to you know, Ruby on Rails design, uh, this is not possible. Uh, I think there's some ex very experimental plugin or something that brings you some event processing. But because the key concept of event processing is that you need to separate your code into a smaller pieces called events. And then you want you know, uh, to let the framework to you know, efficiently execute them. So, but the, it's not that bad. If you are using Ruby on Rails, it's kind of limiting, but you can use uh, Ruby fibers, which are a green thread for Ruby 1.9, or and code code the, you know the I/O for your own, or you can uh, uh, use another uh, options like Goliash, which is a framework and server. And if you are using Sinatra, um, there's a I think in the stable, stable version there's some support for ASIC, as, asynchronous processing there. So it's state of you know, event processing is not the best. I mean, uh, not for Ruby on Rails applications, at least. So when should you consider you know, trying out JRuby, making a proof of concept like me? If your application is not built around event pro, you know, uh, pattern, or if your application takes a decent amount of memory, or if, you, if your application contains a lot of I.O., and in our case, we do have a SQL database, and we do have a lot of REST, AP, REST, REST calls to the backend engines over the HTTP, HTTPS. And if you have a Ruby on Rails application, basically you can check all of, the, all of these. So, big fat warning, uh, JRuby is not the, you know, the only option you have. There are several other things. There's the Ruby News uh, you know, uh, compiler for Ruby. There's REE if you want and also on other things. Yeah, and by the way, some, some languages, I'm a big fan of Google Go, some languages has built-in concurrency in the runtime, which is great because you don't need to care about this. Runtime can, do, can decide what to do and can decide if, you, if it will reuse uh, OS threads or not. Um, it's pretty interesting domain. Okay, well Java, no way. Uh, Okay, now the part when I want to describe several issues I had when I started porting Cotel on JRuby. I was surprised and I had only like five issues. One issue I will describe right now was the biggest one and then several other, maybe four small issues and it was pretty straightforward. And right now I'm happy to announce that JRuby, uh, Cotel runs on top of JRuby just fine. And there are a couple of issues but it works basically. So. First point I want to give you, and I've been given this from the Talkbox community, is don't use Talkbox if you are porting to JRuby. Just use plain JRuby, start the application within a, a Ruby a web server like Webrick, which is you know, in, included in Rails, and do the stuff. It works because 
If you're not familiar with JBoss AS, you can expect some issues with configurations, but you need to get uh, things rolling. Now, JRuby is a little bit slow when, when we are talking about starting. It's very fast when you know, it executes, but when you talk about starting, it's a little bit slow, and I had some issues with this. So I was trying to find some options how, how to solve this, and nothing worked for me. But to give you some overview. How slow it was. Yeah, I, I will, I will tell you right, later, okay? So, so first of all, this is taken from a wiki, a wiki page of JRuby, and you can run your Java in the client mode, and you can, for example, come on, you know, turn off compile mode of JRuby, so in, it will interpret the stuff. It starts a little bit better. Then you can provide a lot of things. If you, you usually need to tune up uh, your memory, uh, like give you the two gigs for running out tests, for example. And there are several other options. Uh, in JRuby 1.7, there's a new feature called ng server, I think it's nail gun server, and if you, if you run it in a, in a, on the terminal on the background and, and you execute something uh, uh, within JRuby, it will find out there's a, a nail gun server running and it will compile the stuff on the server, and uh, if the, you know, your program will exit and then you start over, it will some, some, somehow reuse these compiled classes. I didn't try that, but it's there. Now, the numbers. Yes, we want to see some numbers. So, Catello on my laptop on this ThinkPad starts using Bundler and using RVM, I'll explain that later, is starting bundle, rake, un, rake environment means it will boot up uh, Rails environment, then it, it will it just exist. So it takes uh, uh, 20 seconds. On the other hand, on, on the production, on Rails 6, Ray, Ruby 1.8, that, that was uh, Ruby 1.9, 1.8, which is uh, slower a bit, it takes only 13 seconds. So Where's the snag? And, and then when I was wanted to start with JRuby, it took two minutes. So that, that's, the, that's the answer for your question. Two minutes start of Catella on the JRuby. That's a pretty much, you know, you can't really do any you know, development with this. So I've been trying to find what, what is happening. And I found a you know, big announcement here. I found that Ruby gems are slow because the way it works is if you install a Ruby gem, it creates a user share something, gem something, Ruby gem name dash version. And there's a lib subdirectory, and every time you, you, you require a banana in Ruby, it will, it will walk down the tree and trying to find banana.rb in all the files, all the versions, all the Ruby gems you have. And now, let's see some numbers. I made, uh, I, I used GNU trace to see how many stat and open codes are uh, exiting with directory or, or file not found. And yeah, I've been using Bundler. Bundler is something uh, on top of RubyGems, which sh uh, allows you to uh, allows you to actually lock down the versions of RubyGems. And on top of Bundler, I have RVM, which is very popular in, in Ruby world, which allows you to manage RubyGems, uh, multiple versions of RubyGems, and create the gem sets, which are actually directories where you install your RubyGems, so you can switch over and over again from one project to another, right? So this is the, the command I used, trace something, uh, and it's a pretty much you know interesting. Uh, this is how you know Ruby uh, you know handles requires, and there's actually a bug on the Ruby zero two zero actually several bugs, and they are working on this, and actually they fixed that for Ruby two zero. Unfortunately, when when I tried that on Ruby two zero, I found out uh, I have found out that the optimization is not so great. It's just, you know, the number was smaller, you know, uh, uh, for, for a not significant amount of, you know, uh, uh, calls. So in a theory, let's show some numbers. We do have like uh, 125 depend Ruby gem dependencies uh, in Catello. This is just a, you know, command to count them. And on the production, if you do a rake environment, so you will try to boot up Catello, it will just, uh, it will show you that the uh, system is doing 4,000, you know, missed, you know, file not found. On my laptop, using Bundler and RVM, it's 170,000 of file not found. Yes, 170,000. For some reason, this was the snag, I, and within JRuby environment, it was very slow. I don't know why, but I'm just telling you. So it's slow, it's not getting better. So if, you, if you're experiencing some issues with JRuby, and starting, try to avoid Bundler, try to avoid RVM, 
and you can use Bundler X, which is a nice extension, which actually uh, made by Elus guys, which actually turned off, turns off Bundler. It's very go good, and we are using this for production. Okay, 10 minutes. Porting issues. So, so this was the biggest problem I had during my you know, JRuby journey uh, with, in Totello. Now, several tips I, I can give you. If you are you know, working with binary files, we are you know, uh, reading and writing uh, these manifests, which are zip files, add a B flag, because for some reason, JRuby is you know, Java environment and maybe it's mangling text, you know, I don't know, encoding or something like that. Just add B and it will work. Active record. I was really scared about active record because we have a big bunch of code uh, coded. We call this orchestration engine, and it's a, a lot of. We have a lot of hooks in active record, and I was really scared if this works. And you know, it was uh, uh, the, the transition was pretty smooth. So what I did is I replaced the uh, uh, RubyGem PG, which is Postgres support for uh, for Rails, with three other. You know, Ruby gems. Uh, you can either do a JDBC way. You can either uh, uh, configure your Ruby application, uh, Ruby on Rails application with Active Record JDBC adapter. Or you can go with, uh, I think it's called uh, Rails Postgres. I, I don't know why I decided to go the JDBC or in a way, and it just works without any configuration. And the reason for that is. Uh, uh, the Ruby community are discovering JRuby and they are very excited about JRuby. So a lot of Ruby gems are fixing, every day they are fixing Ruby, uh, J, you know, errors and bugs for JRuby. So my advice is if you want to go to, to, to port your application to JRuby and you are able to upgrade all your dependencies to the latest and stable, latest and greatest versions, do that. But with, with Catello, I, had I hadn't this chance because we need, for some reasons, we need to support all the rails. And right now there's a 3.2 stable version and I had some issues with adapter because there, is, there was like some kind of AP incompatibility and I had some issues. So if you boot up a Catello under JRuby right now, you will enc encounter this error. Uh, unfortunately, it's during the uh, dashboard page. But we are in the process of migrating from Ruby 2.0 to 3.2 uh, and while, one, once we finish that, it will disappear. And the last issue was improper Rails namespace. This one's pretty uh, exciting because in Ruby uh, it was working, and we had uh, si since uh, since uh, Rails has this uh, concept of uh, automatic loading, it was uh, it was loading it for in Ruby, but in JRuby it was not lo loading. So I discovered a bug that was you know hidden for us. So I fixed that, and it worked in both in both. So we have uh, six minutes or oh, ten minutes. And I've decided to, uh, to so I'm, I'm pretty done with, uh, with JRuby, Catello and JRuby and that kind of stuff. So if you have questions, go ahead now, and then we can leverage the rest of, the, of our time. I, I would like to show you some tricks with System Tab and Ruby. I actually used to tr track down some issues and other issues. No, we unfortunately we're not using any of these. We are just I'm just able to boot up Catello and you know just a web application Rails Ruby on Rails. Unfortunately, if we have a if I have a more time to work on that, maybe I'll I, I can do this. But yeah, unfortunately no. Any other question? So did you have to fix any upstream uh, libraries? Uh, I mean that you used to in your uh, project. I, I was surprised. No, uh, it was it, it just worked. I had, there are some couple of issues, and of course I have to say, Catello UI works, but I didn't have time to, uh, to uh, run all, of, all of, our, of our test suites, so I can't tell it's 100% you know, green, but you know, the basics works, you can import, synchronize stuff, uh, so there are more issues perhaps. Which version of JRB did you use, because uh, Talbox ships with more? Yep, I, I was using the latest and greatest 172, I think. Okay, thank you. And one point is, uh, uh, I was pretty successful with automa automating because every time I provision a machine, uh, Catalog machine, 
Uh, I made a small script that, tur that, that takes a Cotello installation running on you know, standard stack, Ruby, um, Apache, uh, HTTPD, and it turns this to a JRuby. And it's a really small script, and I, I uh, advise you, you know, to automate the things uh, as, you know, as, uh, as soon as possible because it can help you, you know, to reduce some time. So, if there are no other questions, just, just uh, you know, uh, raise your hand if you have any uh, test and tap thing. Uh, so I had an issue when, when something on the long, long term, uh, longer term running Cotelo instance was, was changing permissions of a file. And since this was a certificate, it you know, blocked Cotelo from running. And I was trying to find a tool how to find, you know, how to track this down. And I discovered, uh, I, I think last year I discovered system tap, which is a great thing. It's an infrastructure to simplify you know, gathering information from running Linux systems. The great thing about system tap is you don't need to modify your application. You don't need to modify your kernel. You, well, you, you don't need, need to restart your server, restart the application. It just works if, if there are some requirements met. And system tab has a st steep learning curve. If you know D-Trace, I don't know D-Trace myself, but if you know D-Trace, it's pretty much similar technology. And it has a uh, C-like syntax for system tab scripts. And it's really, I was able to write my first script after two hours of you know, reading the documentation. It can be, system tab can be a very low level. You can track a system functions or even system calls, I guess. But it does support higher level things like JVM, Python, I didn't test those, and Ruby. But there's one, one uh, in, in important thing to say. Since system tab is fortunately part of RHEL and Fedora, and kernels are system tab ready, so you don't need to you know, mangle with kernels, anything just works. But the Ruby extension, the Ruby part, if you want to track down the Ruby function calls, the extension is in RHEL 6.2, and the feature is uh, with this uh, errata. So if you need to have a 6.3 6 plus or 6.2 with this errata. With this errata, we have uh, rebuilt uh, Ruby with, with uh, system tab extensions. So you, can, you need to have this. This project has very nice documentation, wiki pages, and there are two documentation books on the RHEL 6 you know, documentation page, and the System Tab, Tab Beginner's Guide is the best. Once you read it, it's pretty, pretty much short. You, will, will be, you won't be expert, but you will be able to write your own scripts. So this is the installation. You just need to install System Tab and System Tab Runtime. The debug info and kernel headers are, I think, optional, but why not to install them? It's for free. And this is my... This is my use case. So there was a file somewhere, like a test, and I was you know, curious what is changing, what the hell is changing the permissions. So what I needed to do is I had to find out its inode, I had to find out the device num numbers for the you know, device it was you know, stored on, and I made it, I copy pasted this script, this is not my work, uh, slightly modified it, and as you can see, it's pretty much you know, C-like syntax, uh, with system tab, you are creating functions called probe, probes, and you can hook into uh, specific actions. And so in this case, I was you know, interested in several kernel functions, and then I'm, I'm just comparing the no device and I don't. And if it's, you know, if the condition is, is okay, then I'm printing the information to the standard output. Now you need to kernel, uh, sorry, user space uh, utility called step, which is included and you just uh, provide a, a system tab script with uh, several options. That's the inode and uh, device. And then once you change it, it will print out the information. Uh, in the background, it does compile system tab script to a uh, C language, and from the C, it does compile uh, to a kernel module, and then it inserts this kernel module. So you obviously need to be a root to, for, for that, or you need to have permissions for that. But, so this is how it works, very basic. And I was able to track down the issue. Very fair enough, in, in like four hours, um, I found the thing. Now, uh, second use case, down the Ruby stack. Simple factorial iterative you know, Ruby program of factorial, printing out factorial of 42. And this is example, you need those Ruby extensions in the system tab. So you need this errata or you need the rel uh, 63 plus. And here you can see, uh, here you can see we are probing Ruby function entry and return, and we are some, somehow indenting the 
output, and we are able to, uh, to we are able to print the you know Ruby execution, and it works. It's you know just ten lines, and you can do things. Actually, you can do this in Ruby. Ruby has some capabilities of of you know hooking into into uh, function calls and things like things like that. But for this, you don't need to modify your you know, this is important. You, do, you do don't need to modify your um, you know, software. You can connect to the production system and peek into Ruby applications just like that. Simple as that. If you want something, uh, something more complicated, then uh, the system tab script, scripting language, has powerful capabilities of aggregating things. It has, a, uh, it has a, a, a arrays. These are you know, hash. These, these are... Uh, mm, hash-like structures where you can uh, send numbers and then make statistics. So in this case, we are trying to find which, are, which methods, which Ruby methods are being called the most. And you can see, uh, you can see the language. Here is the at count. So we, we are actually aggregating the, we can do also average or this kind of stuff. And here, the, the for each syntax uh, shows you can do f and the others, fn underscore calls minus, which is, you know, sort, uh, sort it and limit it by thir 30. So it's a very powerful language. And it just works. So in this case, we need to optimize big num and fixed num, right? And the last, uh, last example is uh, pretty much uh, slightly modified version from the, from the wiki page of system tab, which is a Ruby top-like interface. What it does is count uh, the same way it counts the Ruby calls, method calls, and every four seconds it will clear, clear the screen and in the top-like interface it will show you, you know, the top function calls. And I've been pretty successful to track down some issues with, with our unit tests. And it just worked. Okay, three minutes, Bundler X. Bundler X is an awesome thing. A uh, lot, of, lot of Ruby developers uh, do use Bundler to, because it allows you to lock down the versions of RubyGems for development, and it, the way it works is you can find Bundler X uh, on these uh, uh, locations. It's in the IELUS incubator my repo. It's a pretty small library, and the, uh, the way Bundler works is you create a gem file, and because Bundler is integral part of Rails, you need to use Bundler when you are using a Rails application. You can, although you can rip it off, uh, then you can't leverage the good things. And I'm, I'm not saying Bundler is bad. For development, it's great. You create a gem file, which, which is a definition of your gems and all the versions you need, you, need, you need. And if you do a bundle install, it will create a file called gem file lock, which will contain, which will, it will resolve all the dependencies, download them, install them, and it will lock down the versions. And if you, if you commit this into your Git, you can be sure that all the developers uses the same version. So this can be useful, but on production, we have uh, RubyGems installed from RPM, right? And if you know, Fedora releases uh, some, uh, some if, if, if the engineers will bump a version, it sometimes can happen, then Catella will stop working. It will, Bundler will immediately exit with, you have a, uh, I don't know, L, OAuth version 111, and I only see 110, so I can't continue. And the, there are several approaches for that. We have been deleting the gem file lock because Bundler would create it every time you start your applications automatically. So we have been deleting it every time in, the, in the, our starting script. And this was not the right solution. So with Bundler X, if you install Bundler X, it's a really small thing, and you insert this into your init code of your uh, Rails application. Basically, this is from config application.rb. And you replace your bundler.require and some group you want to use with this, uh, with this uh, statement. And uh, so if it finds gemfile.in, it will turn off Bundler completely and use Bundler X, and it will require those, uh, those Ruby gems without you know, looking on the versions. It will just do require, require. You know, it works faster and it it's, you know, prevents from problems. So what we do in the spec file of Catello RPM, we just rename gemfile to gemfile in, in sorry, and problem solved. So this is very nice, and we have been trying to push this upstream or to ask Bundler author to, to give, give, give us a way to turn off Bundler somehow, but uh, we didn't succeed, obviously. Okay, I did it. Um, 
so now questions, I think I have one minute out of time. All right, if you have questions, you can find me here. You can pick me on rsc.ap. Thanks.